Welcome to Unit 16. In unit 16, we're going to do some things with those uh, Lewis structures we developed earlier and just kind of get an idea of uh, what the shapes of molecules have to do with their properties and things of that nature. The sections in the textbook are 4.7, 4.11, and 4.12. You might take a look at those. So there's pretty much three key topics here. One is Vesper theory, <coughs> which sounds like a mouthful, which it is. It stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Talk about electronegativity <coughs> a little bit in the sense that atoms don't pull electrons through the same same ability. And we're going to look at how we identify compounds as being polar or nonpolar. And so we'll take a run through this and see these three sections, 14, 15, 16, there are a lot of stuff. So if you're getting overwhelmed, that's this is a lot of stuff that comes into these sections. Don't get discouraged or anything. Just kind of take your time, go back and look at them again and get a good sense of it. Um, <coughs> Vesper stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And it turns out that geometry of molecules is very important in determining some of their properties. For example, uh, the idea that oil and water don't mix has to do with their electrical properties, which are related to their, um, their, their shapes and things of that nature. Uh, electrons tend to repel each other because they're negative charges. They don't much like each other at all, just like positive charges wouldn't like each other either. And we look at a Lewis structure for a molecule, uh, what we think about is once I draw a Lewis structure, I keep in mind that the atoms, the electrons, will try to get as far away from each other as they can. They'll spread out, whatever, however they can do that. And so, <coughs> the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory kind of summarizes all of that for us. Take a look at. So <coughs> here's kind of a summary table. The summary table says as we're looking at here in the left column, the number of bonded atoms. So there's Two in these examples, uh, HCN, CO2, there's a central atom has two atoms bonded to it. Here in this molecule, this could be SO3 or any one of those, I have an atom in the center part here that's bonded to three atoms along the outside. Here I have an atom in the center part that's bonded here to two atoms, and then there's also a lone pair of electrons that you don't see, or a non-bonded pair of electrons you don't see. This guy has four things bonded to him, four atoms bonded to him in here, and so these tables, these columns over here are the ones that tell us about that sort of arrangement. And what it tells us in the end is that you might notice that um, <coughs> the lone pair of electrons or pairs of electrons are important in helping us determine the geometry. So here I have a case where I have three atoms, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, carbon, and oxygen, all in a straight line because there are no lone pair electrons in that carbon to throw things off. Down here I have three electron, three atoms that are in a line, but there's a lone pair of electrons up here. This is SO2. We saw that earlier. And so that shape is actually bent. It's bent in a triangular type of shape. And so the shape of the molecule comes really directly from what those lone pair of electrons are doing around that central atom. Uh, look at water. Water's got three atoms in it as well. Hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen at the very bottom. But since I have these lone pairs of electrons up here, what I find out is this thing is going to be bent in its geometry. So the terminology we look at, our shapes are going to be linear, trigonal planar, bent, tetrahedral, pyramidal, meaning they have three legs, but they're not in a plane. Notice this is ammonia. He's got his kind of popped up a little bit in nitrogen. There should be a lone pair of electrons up here on top of that. And then water is going to be bent. So... <coughs> What does that do for us? Well, let's look at some examples and see what we have here. We have a molecule here that has two attachments to it, hydrogen and nitrogen over here. So you see it only has two things around that central atom, two bonded atoms around the central atom, no non-bonded electrons, he's going to be linear. It falls right into that table we just saw. If I look over in this one, nitrogen in the center here, I've got three hydrogens bonded to it, so I have three atoms bonded to it, I have one non-bonded atom around it, one non-bonded pair of electrons around it, it's going to be pyramidal. Okay, it's going to be kind of, take your three fingers and put them on the table, and then your knuckles, kind of like the nitrogen on top of that. Then if I take and look at, extend it a little bit further, here's carbon dioxide in that central atom right here. I don't care about all these other lone pairs, none of that matters to me. The carbon here has two things to worry about. One is an oxygen atom here, and one is an oxygen atom there. He's got two bonded atoms to him. He's got no non-bonded electrons. He's going to be a linear molecule. Look at water. I mentioned water earlier. Hydrogen, hydrogen, lone pair, lone pair. So he has two bonded, 
two lone pair, he's going to end up being bent. And here's carbon tetrabromide, carbon in the middle, four bromines around it on the outside. So he has four bonded atoms, no non bond You say, wait a minute, there's all sorts of non bond or lone pair atom electrons around here. We don't care. We're looking only at the central atom in this. So let's take a look at a at a FET simulation for this. And I'll include this link uh, with this unit in Blackboard as well, so you can go play with it if you want to. I can just figure out which one it was. <coughs> and that wasn't it. Um, it's the one that goes... Oh, there it is. I see it. Right here. I like those shapes. So let's look at this model here. And so there's an atom stuck here. And suppose I stick a bond on him like that. And I stick another one on him, something like that. Now it's going to tell me the angle. It tells me the angle. That's 180. That's a linear type of molecule, is it? <coughs> this would be like a carbon dioxide. If I take and bring a lone pair of electrons onto it, now what happens is now that thing gets bent. You can kind of see that, that now my my oxygen, my carbon, my oxygen, these guys are going to be, whatever this molecule is, looks like this, he's going to be a bent molecule and has an entirely different shape because of that addition of the lone pair. Let me take the lone pair off. If I put on a another bond, there goes my, my 120 degrees again. And so I can take and kind of play around with this, and you can take and play around with this, and kind of get a sense of how these guys sort of go go together. So if I took this thing here and I put two lone pair on, the temptation would be to say, well, I'd have two bonds and I'd have two lone pair of electrons. Probably be linear, right? But no, what's it do? It does that. <coughs> this is what the water molecule does. He's bent in molecular geometry. Okay, so you kind of get a sense. You put them in, they just, notice how they just spread out. If I put another lone pair in here, I don't know what will happen, if it'll take it or not. Yep, took another lone pair, did this to it. Okay, it shows me this type of structure to it. So it has these things, takes these different shapes, trying to minimize the electron repulsions. So let's then go look at something related to this too. We're going to build up to, to somewhat of a hopefully good finish at the end of this. Is in ionic compounds, remember we talk about electrons being transferred from one metal to from a metal to a non-metal. In reality, they aren't totally transferred. We can pretend they are. Well, electrons are not necessarily shared equally between two atoms in a covalent bond. So if I have a hydrogen over here and a carbon over here, a nitrogen over here, they may not pull on the electrons the same, so the electrons may shift more to one side of the, of the bond than to the other side. And so what we've got is a scale. Uh, it, it's called the electronegativity scale. It tells us something about the, rel the ability of atoms to pull electrons towards themselves in a chemical bond. That's what it tells us about. So the scale has been set up. It tells us who's got the strongest, the highest electronegative, who pulls the electrons the most. And so if we look at a t section of that table, I've stuck it in over here, and notice the highest electronegativity value is over here with fluorine. That's not surprising. Fluorine's right next to noble gases. Fluorine's looking to pick up electrons. Fluorine's kind of small, so they can get pretty close to his nucleus, his positive nucleus. And so it's not surprising to have the highest electronegativity, but notice it gets... Smaller as I go to the left on the periodic table, and it gets smaller as I go down on the periodic table. And so, uh, if you look at hydrogen and carbon, they're kind of similar in terms of, of electronegativity. Carbon's a little bit more electronegative, hydrogen's a little bit less. And so, um, when we talk about metals and nonmetals or ionic compounds, those differences are big enough that it's almost like a complete transfer, but not really. So, the nonmetal nonmetal bonds are covalent. They involve the sharing of electrons we've seen, but you can see they're not going to be equally shared. So let's talk about different types of bonds then we can have, just based on this electronegativity type of idea. <coughs> and what we can do is realize that the bigger the electronegativity difference is, then the more one of those atoms will be pulling electrons towards itself. Okay, and so we look at the difference between these two values and get a sense of that. There are numbers out here. These aren't necessarily hardcore numbers, but if the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is about 0.5, we tend, generally tend to say that that's pretty much a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, the electrons are pulled about equally in that covalent bond. Okay, both atoms can pull about the same. So polar means they're separate, like the poles of the Earth are at opposite ends. This is a charge pole, negative, positive, separated out inside of there. If the difference in electronegativity is between a half and two, well, then we're going to call it a polar covalent bond, meaning it's still covalent. They're still sharing electrons back and forth, 
but one of the atoms is pulling the electrons more towards itself than the other atom is. So you almost have like a, it's almost like a stick where end is, one end is more negative and the other end is more positive. And if the difference in electronegativity between the atoms is greater than two, we generally consider that to be an ionic interaction, meaning they've transferred electrons. <coughs> so the categories to keep in mind are half and two, basically. Below half, you're nonpolar. Between a half and two, you're polar covalent. Above two, you're ionic. Here's examples down here. If you want to look at a nitrogen oxygen bond, difference in electronegativity is 0.5, so it means he's a polar covalent bond. Same for aluminum chloride. If I get to carbon and hydrogen, we call it nonpolar covalent. If we get to potassium and oxygen, we call it ionic. And so it's a simple little table to work with. No, don't memorize any of those numbers. If I were asking you about that, I'll give you numbers. But. Okay, so a couple of different ways we can represent the polarity in a bond. Um, one is, and we can use Greek letters to show what we call a partial charge. And so the nitrogen here is pulling, and the oxygen here is pulling electrons a little bit more than nitrogen. So this is a negative charge. That delta, Greek delta, means kind of a partial charge. And over here I have a positive charge, slightly positive charge. Same with aluminum chlorine and phosphorus and fluorine. The way this probably a little more descriptive is to use the arrow representation. Because when I draw the arrow, think of it this way. This end of the arrow looks kind of like a plus sign, doesn't it? So that's the plus side of the bond, and this is the negative side of the bond over here. This is the plus side, this is the negative side. This is the plus side, this is the negative side. That little plus sign tells you, okay, the arrow's pointing toward the electron. So it pointing to the more negative end of the molecule. So if we take a look at that, we can talk about bonds. We talk about whether a bond is polar or not polar. But then if we expand that and start talking about molecules, it turns out that I, when I make a molecule, a molecule can be polar or not polar even though it has polar bonds in it. Okay? Even though it has polar bonds in it, it can be polar or not polar. And so um, if you think about, for example, methane over here, CH4, uh, this red cloud is showing me what the electrons, what the charge looks like around there. <coughs> and you can see it's all uniform around there. And I have a carbon in the middle. I have four hydrogens being pulled equally uh, at each of the corners in that tetrahedral geometry, this guy would end up being a nonpolar molecule. If I look at ammonia, where I have a lone pair of electrons up here, I've got him bent down into this trigonal pyramidal shape. In this guy, all those bond polarities would not cancel out, and ammonia will be polar in nature. And this has effects on their properties, and we'll see that shortly down the road, not in this unit, but in another unit. So how can you tell if it's polar or not polar molecule? Well, there's some kind of simple rules you can use, simple guidelines. Remember, these don't always work, but they'll work for what we're going to do. <coughs> and it goes something like this. You can draw the Lewis structure. If the central atom has any non-bonded pairs around it, it'll be a polar molecule. It doesn't matter if it has two or three or four. It'll be, a non it'll be a polar molecule. If the central atom has only atoms around it, and they are all the same, the same atom, it's a non-polar molecule. But if the central atom has only atoms around it and any of them are different, <coughs> it is then a polar molecule. So I think of CH4 on the previous slide, four atoms around it, all the same, nonpolar. Ammonia on the previous slide, three atoms around it, all the same, but he also has a lone pair of electrons around him, which means he's not going to be, uh, he will be polar, a polar molecule. So these are general guidelines. We can also get things that have five and six electron domains around the central atom, and we're not going to worry about those for right now. Okay, so let's take a look at a simulation of this one too while we're at it and see if this will help at all. So let's look at just two atoms together here. So here's an atom A and atom B. And the electronegativity of the atoms are set up in here. So for A, it's right there, B is right over here, and you notice they have the same electronegativity right now, and so right now there's nothing very exciting here, because unless you like yellow and green. And what I can do is take and change the electronegativity of A. Let's say, <coughs> let's say I make A less electronegative. What do you suppose is going to happen? Which way, which side of the atom will become more negative? If I make A less electronegative, if I slide A over to the left, this cursor up on top, I slide him to the left, make him less electronegative, that means B is more electronegative. Which way will the arrow point in here? Well, let's try it and see. Looks like that. To make it more electronegative, the arrow points this way. That's because I've made A less electronegative, which means that B now is more electronegative, so the electrons are drawn toward B. 
and that's where my arrow points. Okay, so I can play with the electronegativity on here, and I can put it up in here. The arrow just gets smaller. The arrow is what we call a vector. It actually, the smaller the arrow is, then the less the difference in charge is between those two. And I can come over here, and I can switch it around if I want to. I can go up to here, and now my A is more electronegative, and so the arrow is pointing toward the A. It points toward the direction where the electrons are going to tend to be a little more uh, prominent. If I look at a system that has uh, three atoms in it, something like this, and this is kind of fun. Let's, let's say that these are all going to be less electronegative. So they all have pretty much the same electronegativity, and it's going to be less than, it's going to be at the low end. Come here. Oh, come here. Okay. So these three all have the same electronegativity. Now if I take B and I start making the electronegativity of B be bigger, what do you suppose is going to happen? Well, if B gets to be bigger, then probably the electrons will be drawn toward B, right? So which way do the arrow point? Let's find out. It points that way. It means that B is more electronegative. Now I've got here, these are called the bond dipoles. Dipole is just the name for that separation of charge. And so these guys are both pointing up like that. And overall, the molecule has this orangey one. It looks like this. So B is more electronegative. The electrons are up this way, pushing this way. Now this vector doesn't have to be sitting right on top of B. If you want, if it makes you feel more comfortable, you can move down here and point at B. Say B's got more negative. B's more negative. You can do that. So you can take them, fiddle around with these. If I take them, start making them uneven here. Notice how that vector up at the top actually changes direction. It can point anywhere inside that molecule. And to get there, we just have to understand something about the geometries and understand something about the electronegativities. And if you look at some real molecules, here's hydrogen fluoride. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Hydrogen is not very electronegative, and so the, 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 uh, the dipole moment, the vector points over toward that side. Oh, I rotated, didn't I? Looks like that. Let's look at, let's look at water. Water is always kind of interesting to look at. There's water. Okay, so water has, um, let's put the molecular dipole on it. Let's get rid of the bond dipoles. But there's my molecular dipole for water. So up here's the negative end of it, over here's the positive end of it. Okay, so water uh, is almost like a little separated charge, a little plus end and a minus end on it as you look at it. And so it's kind of a good way to uh, fiddle with this and play with this. I'll have this link uh, with this unit in Blackboard. You can play with it a little bit if you want to on your own and see what happens with it. And I think, oh, uh, last slide is, so why do we care? It's probably always good to have a slide like that. I haven't done that very much for you, but why do we care about it? What we care about it is that the polarity of species has a lot to do with their properties and interactions with other matter. So for example, uh, things that have high boiling points might be ones that might be more polar, they might be more attracted to each other, things that have uh, high melting points, things that have low vapor pressure. So we have, we have a link between all this gibberish about polarity and shape and all. There's a link between that and properties that we see. Solubilities. Oil and water don't dissolve. Turns out that water is polar. Oil, gas is not polar, so they don't sink into each other. They don't mix very well. And so we'll look at some of that later on. we we'll start talking about liquids and intermolecular forces and things like that. So that was chapter 16, unit 16.